Welcome back to iHeartRadio So Bad It's Good. Today, we have somebody that is so good, they're great. She made one of the biggest splashes on reality TV last year when she won the 24th season of the insanely popular competition reality series, Big Brother. Her speech at the finale, you guys, was one of the most inspirational things I had watched in 2022. There were so many things in this speech that blew me away, but she really pointed out she was more than her wins on that show. And I truly think she is so much more than her wins on that show. She hails from Michigan, where she was Miss Michigan in uh, uh, the pageant, and she won Miss Congeniality. It wasn't just a movie, folks, at the Miss USA pageant. So I think everyone, including myself, wants to know what is next because she is just a bright, shining light, and we always have to support those. Uh, she most recently said on Twitter that I have to ask her about this. She says, I know all of you want to see me back on your TVs, and you will, and I can't wait to talk her, to her about all of this and more. So welcome to So Bad It's Good, Taylor Hale. Thank you. I love that intro. That was a good one. It's making me cry. Or is it just <laughs> that was a good <laughs> Okay, well, we're done here, Taylor. We'll see you next time. Yeah. So much, um, That's all I needed. Listen, when I heard your speech uh at Big Brother, I was like, oh my God, she's running. She's running for president. So this is I will I will vote for Taylor Hale. Would you come on this podcast to announce your presidency? Oh, wow. I don't know. You know, I was lucky enough to just do a little interview with the governor of Michigan and she's trying to get me to run too. So I might have to give her dibs over the announcement, but you will be on the press feed. I promise you that. <laughs> that's, that's all. I just want to be at the table. Um, I know you're a huge fan of reality shows as well. And I was just looking, you guys are nominated at the MTV uh, TV and movie awards in best competition reality series. And you're up against some heavy hitters. What does it mean that your season of big brother made the splash that it did? And I really attribute that a lot. I mean, mainly to you, what does that mean to you? Well, thank you. Uh, it, you know, when I went into the Big Brother house, or even when I was researching the show before I got into the house so I could know what the hell I was getting into, I saw Big Brother as a microcosm of society. I saw it as the good, the bad, and the ugly of how we interact with each other. And I think my season in particular highlighted so many different aspects of that. It highlighted um, where women stand in this world, how we have to communicate to get by, how black people, people of color and colorism plays into all of that. I think conflict, conflict resolution, grace and forgiveness, racism even, these are all topics that were themes that I kind of carried on my back throughout the entire show. Yeah. But what I love about the season is that it didn't just end, thankfully, with a nasty taste of misogyny, sexism, racism, every conflict had a resolution and an opportunity for someone to redeem themselves, except for maybe like one person. But outside of that, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm really proud. <laughs> I'm really proud of what this season is. <laughs> and I'm happy that it's being recognized on a larger scale. So I know we're up against some heavy hitters, but just being nominated and being in the mix, it, it feels, it makes me feel like I did a good job. Um, I remember watching your speech and it was like, in that moment, did it feel, I mean, I just can't imagine having that kind of composure and being able to tie in your whole experience within a two minute or less speech to all of those people that uh, some had backstabbed you, some had supported you, you had been on the block so many times, you, you know, and, and usually it doesn't go the way of the good person sometimes. I think that's what was so special about yours is that we've been used to over the last decade of just, I don't know, sometimes you feel like the good guys aren't winning and it was just such this amazing thing of like, could she do it? Could she pull this off in that moment? What was going through? What was going through your head in that moment? Oh, just advocate for yourself. And that's something that as a black woman, I've had to do my entire life. And again, it's just reflected in reality TV. And I knew that if I could just get in one of those final two seats, whether I won my way there or made an alliance that got me there, I'd have the opportunity to advocate for myself. Now, in my research and any fan or casual watcher of Big Brother, they know when you get to those final two C's and you hear those speeches, they're pretty boring and dull. And it's like, why did you sign up for an up to 90 day game? If you're not going to give me the good, summarize your game, sell it to me, tell me why I'm going to give you $750,000. 800,000 in my case. <laughs> yeah, because by the way, you guys, she also won the audience award as well. It wasn't, just, she just didn't take the competition. She was also the favorite of the audience and got an extra 50,000 for that. It was pretty good. It's been holding up pretty nice. <laughs> but you know, when you're sitting in that final two seat, I'm not going to waste the highs and the lows of that 82 days that I was in that house, 92 
94 if we're counting a sequester. Like that is your one moment to take your opportunity. Like Eminem, you get one shot. Do not miss your opportunity. <laughs> wow, Mich- a Michigan girl through and through. Wow. <laughs> um, uh, the Big Brother experience, you were talking about researching when you did your research. How did you come uh, to be on Big Brother? Were you an avid watcher of the show? Who convinced you to uh, audition for the show? What was that process like? Well, my process was unique. So like you said, I was Miss Congeniality at Miss USA. I was Miss Michigan USA. Um, I had about 5,000 followers. That's not significant. Like I wasn't earth shattering before everything, but having those titles is enough for a casting person to shoot you a DM. So I was DM'd by someone asking if I wanted to go on The Amazing Race at first. And I was like, I don't have any friendships I want to ruin. I don't know about that. <laughs> the person's bio also had Survivor and Big Brother in it. I'm not an outdoors girl. So I said, hell no to Survivor. But what about Big Brother? <laughs> and that day, the conversation picked up. We were on uh, FaceTime. And it, it just kind of played out where I ended up getting on the show. And, you know, I look at the Big Brother fandom or any reality TV show fandom the same way that I look at the pageant fandom. These are people who are dedicated to what it is they're consuming. They love the product. They love the history of it. And with a game like Big Brother, I was not going to be the stupid pretty girl that got on the show and just kind of ditzed around until I got to the end. I wanted to play a game that the fans could respect. And I think that goes across any show. You know, you think about shows like The Housewives or Vanderpump Rules. If you have some newbie on the show and they don't know what they're doing, why are you here and how did you get here? And how quickly can we and you're gonna get you? you're going to get eaten up by the fandom. I mean, the fandom yeah. now is so uh, sophisticated uh, in their their fanning that they will completely cut you at the knees. So, I mean, if there was a montage of your training, was it like Rocky? Were you like going over past seasons? Were you reading? Were you talking to past contestants? How do you go into training for something like Big Brother? Did you lock yourself in a room? <laughs> Basically, I was uh, living my mom's place. I was living my mom's and I was just binge watching old seasons of Big Brother. And I took notes on my iPad, my not my iPad, my uh, Apple notes. I would take notes on personalities, not gameplay, because I don't think you oh, can wow. replicate. I don't think you can replicate gameplay. Imagine uh, name a reality show. Well, I mean, I, listen, I know you're a fan of Survivor. I, uh, they they really go into gameplay and they do a lot of research like the, the cast of Big Brother will do. Right. So you can research games that are played, the competitions that are played and have an advantage there. But when it comes to replicating the way that somebody else is playing a game, that's not going to work out for you because you have super fans coming into these shows and they're going to clock you and say, oh, you're playing just like Janelle did or you're playing just like uh, Sheena played on Vanderpump Rules. Like you're going to understand (laughs) how other people are maneuvering, right? (laughs) And I yeah. didn't want to go in there and just have someone pick me out and say, I know how to get this girl out very quickly. I had to understand what was happening around me and how to react to it. But if I replicate somebody else, it wasn't going to end well for me. Yeah, I mean, the the personality thing is so brilliant in a lot of ways. Is that something that you've always had a talent of reading people, of picking up on social cues and using that to your advantage? Yeah. Well, look, I was a personal stylist for men before I even got into the pageant world. Uh, that's a little bit of a lie. I, before I won my title, I was a personal stylist. So I understood sales, how to read people. I understood sensitivity because clothes can be really intimate. And men in particular are not going to be the ones that open up the most, especially when it comes yeah. to being vulnerable with clothing. So I know how to break through some hard shells. And then when you get into the pageant space, you're talking to people every single day. You have people that want something from you every single day, and you are obligated to be some sort of presence or fixture in their life every single day. So I understand. And composure, you have to have, you keep your composure with a smile on your face, which by the Mm -hmm. way, you're doing that right now. I mean, like you are so brilliant at this, but also you make it seem real. You make it seem like it does come from your heart. And I, I, I mean, I'm going to believe that is who you are, but it is interesting that that is the thing that shines through so much. And it really, isn't it amazing that all of this stuff in your past was able to help you on a show like this? You would never know. Look, the show's about lying and bats, backstabbing and competing and manipulating. And here I am, like, I just men for a living and I wear a shiny crown. <laughs> Let's do this. No, I never, ever thought that this would be something that would help me in a game like Big Brother. But I think that's what I appreciate so much about my win and my gameplay. It just shows that 
a softer version, a less bombastic version of gameplay can win. And usually that is a game style that uh, gay men or women or more feminine people will have to play in the house and are penalized for. So I just hope that there's a shift now where the social game, the way that we maneuver with one another is a lot more um, herald. Yeah, I mean, w when you start watching those seasons, though, was there a moment of like, what did I get myself into? Was your mom going, I really, I would prefer if you didn't do this. This seems like you're potentially setting yourself up for a really bad time. I think if, if we think about the tone of the game, right? When you look at a survivor or you look at an amazing race, these are, or uh, traders, these are games where it's set out to be intense and really competitive and strong. But Big Brother, the tone of the game is it's a fun summertime thing that we're all hanging out with. And the show rarely shows moments of conflict that aren't fun or entertaining. So my yeah. mom actually loved the celebrity version. She would walk around from room to room with her iPad, just seeing what like all these other players were doing the season before I was on. So it yeah. was fun. The 24 seven cameras was a little bit concerning for her, but I'm grateful for the cameras. I think they helped me out in the end. No, I, I truly think they did. And what an opportunity though, also, like you said, to actually make it even more. I mean, Big Brother really is a microcosm of where we're at. And it's it was so refreshing to actually see that season start to truly acknowledge that. I mean, really acknowledge that. I mean, you had a uh, all white block at one point voting again. I mean, you had like some really wild things that really I would think made, you know, made us as Americans kind of see where we're really at. And you, I, I just, I mean, I was blown away by stuff. I mean, you talked about in, even in your final speech about what it's like, the the pitfalls of being a woman, of, of taking that in and how to rise above that. But it is interesting that this all was shown in one season and you didn't even almost fully realize until it was summed up in those moments at the very end. Yeah, yeah. I would like to thank the uh, cider company that provided us with ciders the night before. That's when I really honed in on my speech. I had like maybe one too many, but it worked out really perfected that speech. <laughs> Grace the wheel, um, we got it going. <laughs> in your head, did you feel like you, uh, when you'd finished the speech, did you're like, I got this, I won this? Or was there a, I mean, uh, was there a hesitation of it still could go his way? It still could go that way? I was able to see the jury's reactions while I was speaking. So in the same the same video feed that you were watching between the jury and me when it was yeah. between, I could see that same feed on the TV in the house. So I could so see you saw the, the tears. I saw the tears. I saw Joseph losing his mind. Like it was great all <laughs> around. But I also just as a critique on extemporaneous speaking, sitting next to Monty and hearing his answers to his gameplay, I was like Come on, bro, like advocate for yourself. He was a strong competitor and he had good points he could speak to, but I think he leaned too much on letting people see his resume in the game. And if you're not going to advocate for yourself and you're sitting next to someone like me who's not going to let you forget what happened, you're going to lose. And that's what happened. So I felt pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you even called him out. Monty has more blood on his hands than me. But as someone who sat on that eviction block six times on eviction night, I have bled at the most in this game. But I've bandaged myself together every single time and gotten up. And I was like, there is no more. I mean, what a way to use exactly what, but to throw it in. And also to still not undermine him. To still comp. I, I know I'm going off on this, but I thought it was one of the really, one of the best moments in reality television that we've had Uh I mean, potentially ever. It's one of those things that you'll keep seeing in uh, probably montage clips for the, no, I mean, honestly, I think you know that. I think you've been told that so much, but even when going back and watching it, you still get the chills, you still get the goosebumps. And I think that's the, one of the things. So, I mean, listen, you tweeted the other day, I'm a huge fan of your Twitter feed and <laughs> you, your, your pin tweet, uh, the, I'm trying to find it right now. Your pin tweet says, I read a little bit at the top. I know a lot of you want to see me back on your TVs and you will, but let's be clear. I will never participate in something that requires my pain, suffering or trauma for public consumption ever again. I paid my dues. So with that, I'm guessing you'll never do uh, a Bravo reality television series. Taylor, what, what do you mean exactly about that? You know, I get asked every 
day, still to this day, are you going to do the challenge? Are you going to do the challenge? I'm not interested in a, a competition reality show like that. I like watching them. I enjoy consuming them. Will I be participating in them? I don't think so. I would jump in to host something, but I'm not looking to compete. I, I think I would much, much rather go out on top like I did. Like I don't think there's beating $800,000 in your first game. So let me take my money. Let me fall back a little bit. But, you know, if there is more of a docu-series type reality show, maybe I'd be into that. So, so we could specify that this is competition-based yeah. reality series. Okay. Definitely. Maybe we should... Let's edit that tweet, maybe. We can really, because I think a lot of, let's edit that tweet. By the way, because I was sitting here really trying to think when I was going over um, how I wanted this to go today, I was thinking like... I could see you in so many different places. Like like you said, I could see you hosting. I could see you do that. I could see you being a housewife eventually. I could, like, I, I mean, I think that it, it would almost, I don't know, I, there's so many opportunities. You could be a straight up actor. You could be a straight up, like, you could uh, represent beauty products, Revlon, all of these things. Where in your heart do you want to go? Because I feel like the world is potentially your oyster at this this point. Oh my God, Ryan, I love you. I'm just gonna like, I'm gonna wake up and give you a phone call every day and be like, "Hey, buddy, what do I need to be doing now?" As long as you'll tell me how to dress, as long as you'll tell me how to dress, Taylor, I have no. idea. If you'll go to Old Navy with me and just, I, I have no idea what I'm doing. I really, I'm wearing basketball shorts underneath here. Anybody watching this, um, I need desperate help, but I'll, I'll pump you up. I'll be your hype man all day long. Okay. Well, I will also confess. I call it the the Zoom mullet. I have like a great top on right now, but I'm wearing leggings, like workout leggings. So we're <laughs> we're here. Wow, yeah. pros! I'm 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 hope I'm going to compete for Mister Congeniality soon, hopefully. Um, but to answer what's your in your question, heart, though? Yeah, it's always been entertainment news for me. I really think that reality TV is, uh, and even just pop culture in general. I think it is one of the more moving forces in our society. I think when it comes to politics, how we communicate with one another, all that is reflected in pop culture or reality TV. I mean. I think back to gay people who were the first of their kind on a reality show and how much that did to move the needle forward into acceptance in our culture. I think about the work that Drag Race is doing into accepting drag performers or trans and non-binary people. What we consume in our free time is how we change our minds and that's reflected in who we end up becoming. So. I love looking at that from a more journalistic perspective. And I think hosting, whether it's hosting a TV show or being in entertainment news is something where I get to flex that muscle in my brain without fully letting go of the thing I love to consume. You, I mean, you said this is that's the thesis of the show. Some people have the misconception of the title so bad it's good to, to me. It's like, no, I truly love this. A lot of people out there will tell us to be ashamed of these pop culture things that we so dearly love. But in reality, they're the most amazing things. And that's why, I, like, I keep going back to the Big Brother. You summed up how these things can touch everything, how they can make us learn and move that needle. But that's it. Like, I mean, from a young age, I just fell in love with reality TV. I would rush home to watch, inter not rush home, I'd be home and watch entertainment tonight and access Hollywood what were your first reality shows that you got you into all this and and then a follow-up question who are your favorite hosts oh wow okay I think my first the ones that I can think of that I would watch with my mom uh the first one was really Queer Eye for the Straight Guy and I remember yes. seeing like that was in my living room and I had people in my family who you know it's early 2000s they were we called them my uncles um, they lived together, never actually came out to me, but it was just in my world. Oh no, not the sound going off. That's uh, iconic. So anyway, That's uh... classic. Um, but yeah, so here I really impacted me. And then as we got older, I was definitely watching things like a shot at love with Tila Tequila. I was watching <laughs> next. We need to bring back next. Next. Oh my God, the next bus, if, I, if you drive you drive the next bus, you just pop up. Guys, if you don't remember next, I don't know why MTV doesn't have just straight up rerun channel because it is brilliant. They would have four facts about each of these people and it would literally be like, I don't wipe after I poo. It would be like the weirdest things ever. And then they would like, you know, it's like, uh, yeah, I'll date him or I won't date him. It was the weirdest show ever, but everybody had their MTV phase and it was so important in the history of reality television. Well, MTV was really giving you the good content. And for more context, the longer the date went on, there was also a ticker that correlated with how much money you would get. So let's say I'm just dragging this date on at the end. Well, I want to extend you, Ryan, a date. Ryan, you could say, actually, I'm going to take this 
hundred dollars <laughs> from being on a date with you for a hundred minutes and dip. Like it's absolutely crazy. It was always and insanely he, cheap too. It wasn't seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. It would be like sixty three dollars. They'd be like, I need that sixty. So badly, desperately. If they brought back next, that is, I would jump on every opportunity to host. I'm not too proud to beg. I will beg Paramount. But, but by the way, this up. is. Yes. These, by the way, Viacom, CBS, I mean, these are the conversations that need to happen to show that there is a fan base for these shows and they bring back every other movie, TV show. Why not bring these classic shows back? Thank you. Because why do I need another live action reboot of Beauty and the Beast? I'm good. I'm sorry, but like- I, yeah. <laughs> I, already, I don't need to see Harry Potter retold in a television series. I already read the books and saw the movies. We're good. good. Um, mm -hmm. Who are your favorite hosts? Favorite hosts. Okay, well, I would be lying if I didn't say Miss Julie Chen Moon Buzz. I love Miss I love Miss Blah One One. I told her I had to do that interview with her since I never got evicted. So I love Julie. I also love that she actually comes from a hard news background. And one of my favorite fun facts is that she and Andy Cohen used to intern together at CBS News. So, Isn't that crazy? I love it. I love it so much. And I think that goes to speak to how much our culture, our politics, our news can be influenced by reality TV and pop culture. Because look at Andy Cohen now. I'm obsessed with Andy. I'm obsessed with his empire. I love RuPaul. I love how these hosts are not just people that walk in and collect a check. They are moguls. They are multi-hyphenates. And of course, not only do I aspire to be like that, it's something that I study often, not just watch yeah me as well i mean you you got the opportunity to be a bartender on watch what happens live uh uh you know in the last year and and i i would what was that experience like i mean I, by the way i want to see you as a guest on watch what happens live fully but what was that experience of being behind the bar and getting to watch him at work oh it was so fun first of all let me tell you something this is not really a secret but i was pretty shocked as a bartender they keep those drinks flowing like every commercial break, there is a little runner and they are just, oh, I'll just top you off a little bit. And you're like, what do you mean? Everyone's like, I'm just going to top you off. I'm like, this is how you get the secrets. This is how you do it. Yes, uh, what, exactly. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but I think I was most shocked by um, how much time Andy gave me as a bartender. Like he really volleyed with me on questions and it wasn't just what he had written on his card. It required a lot more knowledge of the show that I was on, which he even told me he didn't watch my show. But to do that show every night and have the knowledge necessary, not only to engage with someone who is not your main guest, but keep a conversation going. I think that's really fascinating. And something else, um, just coming from the pageant world that I've known, if you don't want to answer a question, don't answer it. You can leave dead space and you can make your host really uncomfortable and they're going to want to pick things up. And that's something I observed about Andy. He does not like to leave dead space. And so anybody who was a host or luckily I knew what I was doing in my position, but it was really fun to see the different quirks that different hosts and guests can have in a moment like that. Yeah, Taylor, you just nailed it on the head. I just talked about this on the show last week because uh, Tom Schwartz from Vanderpump Rules was on Watch What Happens Live recently. I don't know if you saw that, and it was oh, the, I saw it. the biggest. Uh, it was the biggest train wreck slash amazing episode of Watch What Happens Live. But Andy gave him that advice afterwards. He talked about it on his radio show. He said, "Listen, I gave him a piece of advice. If you want me to move to the next thing, just." say a simple sentence and stop and I will fill in that dead air, but you never stop Tom Schwartz. And I was oh. like, this is brilliant. I love the minutia of interviewing somebody from a mind that does it every day. But man, Schwartz was a train wreck. Did you agree? It was miserable. And I loved every second of it. I, my I dog was there the whole time. And not only was my dog, <laughs> Andy's jaw was on the ground. So I knew he had something good. And that's so funny. I didn't even know Andy's <laughs> Well, Andy, but that's what I was thinking. It's amazing. Um, also, Stern has this uh, technique that I, I find fascinating where he'll start the interview as they're walking in the door and he'll be like, oh, I was just thinking about you the other day. And he'll also throw in a, a piece of information that's incorrect. So they'll correct him and it'll comfort the guest a little bit that like, no, let me actually tell you. And I always think those things are so brilliant when hosts actually care that much to to really think about what could potentially give the, the best interview. Uh, we geek out about the same things. Uh, in regards to reality series, we talked, you talked about in that tweet that you said, you know, you don't want your personal pain to potentially ever affect anything. Um, we're watching on Vanderpump Rules right now mm. that happening. 
Um, mm. what, what is your opinion of watching Vanderpump Rules and Scandal and their relationships going through the mud for all of our enjoyment pleasure? And by the way, unfortunately, it really is enjoyment pleasure because we realize when something is real and it just what are your thoughts on all of this? And and would you, I mean, this is another, like, I don't know if I'd ever want you to put yourself through that. <laughs> well, listen, talk about schadenfreude because this whole scandal thing, I am living for it. And I feel bad, but I kind of like it. Again, schadenfreude. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's, there's so many different ways to talk about this, right? Because I just was in a very public relationship and thank God, like that person is still my best friend to this day. But I know what it is like to have to deal with the public's consumption and dissection of your relationship. Even when he and I tried to draw a line and make it private, people felt so entitled to every detail of our relationship, content about our relationship, because they saw a majority of it forming, or at least I'd say the base of it forming on a 24 seven live feed camera. You get really connected to people when you see them waking up to go brush their teeth or going in the shower or talking game, anything like that. Now, I can sympathize in that aspect, but I also got thoughts about Scandal, okay? Because what? Yes, bring, bring, bring up. I mean, wait, did did you happen to watch last night's episode yet? Did you even? Yes, uh, I did. Did I also? Wait, saw let me. I, I just brought this out for you in case you did. Now, Tom Sandoval has been on this show. I mean, pre. Uh, well, he he wasn't cheating at the time. It was like you know, and I'm actually friendly with was friendly with Tom and Ariana Ariana now. Yeah. But he gave me one of the Richella bracelets from the Richella Festival. He oh. he created a real Coachella wristband. Yes. There's only he said there's only 15 of these in existence, and I have one. I'm gonna sell it back to him, I think, because I don't want it. It's a bad omen. Now, give yeah, me your yeah, thoughts on all of this. Okay, so number one, again, you all know by now, I'm part of the pageant world, or at least was at one point in time. I did not know that Raquel Rachel was until I watched the beginning of the season. Now, when she started crying on that date, I understand what it is like to lose and not be able to pursue the thing that matters so much to you. But here's the thing about pageants. The pageant used to be the thing that created the overnight celebrity. Now it's reality stars. The attention clout, fame, brand sponsorships and deals that you could have gotten as Miss USA are significantly minimal compared to what you have as a star on Vanderpump Rules, who at the time was engaged to one of the long standing stars of Vanderpump Rules. When she started crying on that date, it showed me this is a person who is deeply insecure and seeks validation in all forms where she can find it. Because you don't need to be competing to be Miss California USA and go to Miss USA if you've already got everything and then some that those titles can't give you. She just needs validation. And that was a massive red flag for me. Then Scandal breaks. And it shows me that this is someone who ran to a guy who was giving her attention, love, comfort, telling her she's beautiful. And I'll say it, okay, maybe a time where she's vulnerable. But you can't give into that. You can't give into that. And you're just showing me over and over and over and the people in your life over and over and over that you desperately seek attention and validation. So baby girl needs some help. And don't even get me started on Tom because like. Well, Tom's, I feel like a lost cause at this point. I, I mean, like, I don't know if you watch these TMZ interviews where they catch him on the street and they're like, him, Tom, what's going on, buddy? On yeah, catch him. Catch him. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to be at the corner of Slauson and right. Brea. And like, you know, it's right. like. But it is wild because you can tell there is this perverse enjoyment or what it looks like that he, you know, it's like, you know, he's even talking about it. Raquel's in a mental health facility. I'm like, dude, you better get in a mental health facility. Like you are, you've done this for 10 seasons. And like, mm -hmm. I'm the weirdo. Like you talk, you were talking about watching on big brother, a relationship forum or something. And people get really personalized into that experience. But I was looking up to Tom. Cause I was like, as a dude that does something weird in his life, he was like letting his freak flag fly. And he doesn't want any other lady, but Ariana and she lets him be weird. So I'd looked up to this dude like a weirdo and i i didn't think he was jacks 2.0 and he was there no. all along but how is a woman though you say raquel should be uh you know you you should be stronger in those situations you should be aware that that kind of stuff is going to happen to you how do you build strength as a woman how have you built strength over the the decades to get to a point where you can't i mean because right now you got to have so many people uh, telling you you're amazing and beautiful and all of these things every day. How do you, how do you keep humble or stay in check? 
<laughs> um, I know what I look like when I first wake up in the morning, so that that'll keep me pretty humble. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, like, let's be serious, right? I have seen enough people get a title or an opportunity, and I've been on the receiving end of them not being a kind person anymore or seeming like their head is too big. And I never want to be that person. I never want to be a person that makes someone else feel uncomfortable. And so, yeah, I do have a lot of people that will run up to me or run around a corner and say, I heard your voice and I just, I knew it was you because I watched for hours and I cried with you and I laughed with you and the finale speech and da, 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 da. But I think what's important to do is to remind those people that I am human just like them. Um, I think the scary thing for me is that, yes, I am on a pedestal for a lot of people. And because I didn't react with anger or which would have been justified, I didn't raise my voice that often in the house. I don't think I did. It was a long time. People <laughs> expect me to be an angel or a saint. And I'm not saying I'm evil or a villain, but I'm also a human being with a wide range of emotions. So when I interact with people, it's just like, hey, yes, thank you for the love and the support because God knows I couldn't have gone through all that without knowing there was an end date. But remember that you can be this person too. And I am this person just like you. You brought up your mom a lot in terms of uh, staying with her, her watching the celebrity big brother. What uh, have you learned from your mom in particular that you took into not only gameplay, but your life on a daily basis? Whoa. Oh my God. Well, my mom was a lot more of a mama bear than I am. So I think one of the things that you can learn from your parents is how you do and do not want to react. And look, she's a Pisces. She's a little bit more emotional than I am. <laughs> I'm like, what are emotions? Hand me a wine glass, make it red. And if it's not red wine, I want bourbon. So like, you know, I watch my mom and like, she bleeds out emotion and being the person that I am, that's a little more reserved in that aspect. I understand how to navigate people who are like her. Um, I understand how to kind of mitigate more tentative situations because I know what it's like to have a person who is an amazing human being, but just has a lot more emotion that's showing. And when you're in the big brother house, again, you don't see the sun for two to three, well, what, like five to six days at a time. You only see the sun maybe two or three days out of the week. You're on a sound stage living in a twin bed. There's going to be a whole range of emotion that other people are showing. And what's important is that you understand how to navigate it so that you aren't putting the target on your back. Now, someone else put a target on my back that I had to navigate and figure that out, but I was only able to get through it because I understand how to deal with other people's feelings and emotions more than anything. Uh, how much do you think coming into uh, one of the, well, not post, but like, you know, pandemic seasons where we mm -hmm. were all locked away in our own kind of personal big brother hell, you know, not hells, but just <laughs> big brother situations. Do you think even that potentially helped a little bit kind of being able to seclude yourself even for a long period of time before going in? Or is it just so, so insanely different? I mean, obviously more colorful in the big brother house. <laughs> it's like you need sunglasses in there for real, not just because of the lights, but the colors of the actual objects they put in there are so bright, but that's a whole other story. You know, I have always been an introvert. I can be a people person, but I need to be like alone at the end of the day. I, I try to say this carefully, but when COVID first hit and we were all locked down, I was like, Oh my God, I yes, to be yes. oh, this is great. And I would get on my zoom call with work. <laughs> people be like, this is awful. I'm dying. And I was like, cheers. It's great over here. Thriving. Like, thriving. I have sunlight. <laughs> it's fantastic. I think I was, I was kind of bred to be in the big brother house, I say, because I can handle conflict well. And I like to be sequestered. I won't say alone. Yeah. I don't get alone in that house. Um, so yeah, I think the pandemic at least altered people's communication skills. I think it altered other people's conflict skills because who were you communicating with and who are you having conflict with for two years? If anything, it might've prepped us for the sequester period before going into the house. Because if you're not familiar, we get sequestered for up to two weeks before going into the house. We're all kept on lockdown in hotel room. You only get to see like one, maybe two different people a day because they bring you breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And maybe a movie if you ask for it. <laughs> Did you ask for a movie? Oh, I, I, the amount of times that I watched Shrek and Spy Kids because I'm talking about guys. Shrek and Spy Kids. Shrek amazing, amazing. Uh, I want to get amazing. Music. 
amazing choices. Um, okay, so the, the sequestering, uh, is there one moment from the show that your family and friends uh, really gave you heck over? Was there like, I can't, I just, you did a great, but my God, that one moment, I just can't. Um, you know, there was, <laughs> was a, a season <laughs> fling that happened. Yeah. And, you know, I got what I needed. He got what he needed. And my friends and family are like, that's the Taylor that I know, but like, damn, on TV. And I'm like, look, you stay in that house, right? It was 70 something days at that point. You don't get any. You're like, action. check my bank account. Check my bank account. It was worth Everything was fine. Yeah. Everything turned out fine. Like um, family and friends, I'm taking you on vacation. So uh, zip it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, what, what, I mean, these are just questions that I'm, I geek out and weird. Like what was Talk the, uh, w what was the first meal you had with your family or your friends, like after getting out of that environment? And also then a nerdy question too, is you, you know, mental health wise, they have you in that for like 70 plus days coming out of that. Do, do they have you speak with people about your mental health about, I mean, you dealt with so many slings and arrows. I would imagine, I mean, you came out shiny, but I would imagine that like some of that stuff can kind of haunt you. Yeah. Well, I, to your first question, I, I love that question, actually. So the first thing that I ate coming outside of the house, they take you into a back room, like on CBS a lot, they take you away in a back room. Winner, winner here. <laughs> Sit here, be alone. And they had a chicken Caesar salad waiting for me. So that was kind of cool. I didn't have to ask for anything. They just brought it on in. <laughs> then I was eating takeout a lot that first month because I stayed in LA at a now friend's house, Todrick Hall. He kind of has a tradition now. Of oh, letting. Todrick, real friends of WeHo, yes. Yeah, yeah. So he has a, he's a massive Big Brother fan, has been for years. And he has, at this point, with the upcoming season, he has a history of letting the people who were in the Big Brother house stay in his mansion, essentially for as long as they need, coming out of the show. We kind of have a little inside joke. We call it the Big Brother halfway house. <laughs> like <laughs> in there, and uh, he gave me his um his uh master bedroom suite while he was out on tour for a couple of weeks i called it the hoh room 2.0 it's this massive massive suite a custom california king size louis vuitton bed and people were bringing me food and hanging out so it was a lot of takeout mostly with the cast so i didn't go home until like a month and a half after can you tell him i competed in big brother i would love to stay there for a little bit that sounds amazing um uh, and then in terms of the mental health, how do they help yeah. you readjust to everything outside of the Big Brother house? So inside the house, uh, you do have access to a therapist that the show will provide. So you can go to the diary room and say, hey, it's, I'm having a rough day or it's been a rough couple of weeks. Can I talk to the therapist? And then the therapist will come an hour or so later. You can talk to them. Uh, but then coming out of the house, the network will provide, I think it's four. I think four therapy sessions for free um, on their behalf. And you can set it up so that the therapist you're already working with or someone local to you will be taking care of you. So that's something great. And then immediately after four. the show. I think, I, let's kick that up. So let's kick that up to eight or 12 or something. Um, okay. Back to more fun stuff in, involving reality as we start winding down here a little bit. Um, so you're watching Vanderpump Rule. What are you, by the way, hey, you all day. I like, listen, I'm like, uh, will you be my co-host from here on out? I'm doing a Vanderpump recap later tonight. Where we're doing, you know, like, know, but do you watch all of the Bravo reality series? Because by the way, I saw on your Twitter feed, I am so excited for Summer House Martha's Vineyard. The yes. preview for this, the trailer looks so exciting, you guys. This season of Summer House, until the last couple of episodes have been like really emotional and kind of a dud. But then the trailer for Summer House Martha's Vineyard seems insanely fun. And it's they're comparing it with Real Housewives of Atlanta back to back on Sunday's nights. So Sunday's gonna be awesome. Are you you're looking forward to that too, I think, right? I love a black night on Bravo. It's always iconic. You can't go wrong. So, and here's the funny thing. I have a lot of family and friends that like would summer at Martha's Vineyard, people I went to college with, people I grew up with. Um, so I'm sure there's a lot of like, um, I feel like Kevin Bacon in this situation. I'm sure I'm going to know a lot of friends, <laughs> and friends in this. I actually got invited to the uh, premiere party that's happening in New York. So I'm going to see if I can make it and, and see if I can get some FaceTime with the cast, but I'm dying, dying to see how good this um, one is. Yeah, it looks so much fun. And I think, you know, this is Summer House. They always say summer should be fun, but this season has been so sad. So I need kind of that fun. I love heavy conversations if you can inject some kind of fun around it. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of Housewives shows, which ones do you uh, do you follow or, or pay attention? still watch okay well i love ultimate girls trip right now it is really it's really giving everything we needed right now but i'm 
I'm mad. I'm mad that anybody had to make Pepsi cry. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, go watch this season. Oh, you guys, Pepsi, they have a, a, a house host each season. And Pepsi mm-hmm. has been the best out of all of them. And he, these these women, I mean, what they made them, they made this poor man break, which is it just shows you how powerful these housewives are. But it also Over shows you what I mean. Bottle of tequila. Who stole the bottle of tequila? And it is this man just breaks on TV and you feel for him, yet it is riveting television. But it also shows you when you put these housewives into a different location, they team up like like the Avengers with Marvel, but like in a bad way. <laughs> the Revengers instead of the Avengers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna trademark that right now. The Revengers. Yeah, yeah, let me on that. Uh, but to, again, to answer your question, of course, I've been a fan of Atlanta for a while. Special shout out to Kenya Moore, my Miss Michigan USA sister. Uh, and also, I know a handful of the Potomac housewives because I did my undergrad in D.C. And being in the pageant space, you just know people who know people. Um, so Candace and I have been at a couple of different things together. And then Ashley, of course, has been in the same circle for a while. And I always want to give a special shout out to Beverly Hills because that is real rich people problems. Housewives is nothing without fat pockets and i love the beverly hills because they have money that lasts for millennia and that's where you get the good stuff and miami well, I mean, so, well dude wasn't miami amazing my by miami the way peacock you guys blew every other <sighs> housewives franchise out the water and here's the thing i want it to be on bravo so badly but i think it flourishes on peacock so maybe so we need like, one day of just a marathon of Miami and then just go say, go, go to Peacock. Cause it lives. Well, it's, it a, really it's a brilliant, lives. brilliant business move to move it all over there. Cause it gets people over on Peacock. They got all the housewives over there. Just like uh Paramount plus has all of the past seasons of survivor. They brought, I mean, you can really dig into these things. I almost want another pandemic just so I can binge again, some of these shows. Um, but in terms of like, I mean, are you allowed at this point to say who, you know, you're not favorites are and favorites. So, I mean, like you seem so composed that you wouldn't really sling any mud. And I appreciate that. But is there somebody that gets your goat in the housewives? And by the way, if not, you can always just say Tom Sandoval. We can just throw it back, back to there. <laughs> Who do I not like of the housewives? Um, I, I got to think of all the franchises now. I haven't it watched changed from season to season. Yeah, I haven't watched Jersey in a while, so I can't really speak to that. I'm not going to lie. Like, Ramona was really just pissing me off a lot in New York. Like, Ramona used to be a fun time, and now it's just it's flat, it's bland, it's dry. When she pops up outside the housewives, I'm not excited. I'm not entertained. So I'm, cl- I'm glad they're doing something different with New York because we, we need a whole makeover. Yeah, for, I think that the Roni reboot is going to be so important to really see okay. if – you know, because some of these shows are like shackled down by the stars that they've created a lot of the times. Mm-hmm. And Ramona, I think, is a great example of she gave so much great service and scenes, but there's an expiration date on some of these. And that's OK, because you honor the things that they've done in the past. But sometimes it's like, where else are we going? It's like watching a, it's watch. It's like watching Shrek again and again and again in in. Uh, before you go into the big brother house, I've seen it, but I think there's so much room. There's so many fascinating women out there. I want to need, I want to see more women's stories and like, there's going to be so many more stars out there that can be created if there's room to give, give it to them. Totally. And New York is unique in that New York is a very, um, very old money and a very new money city. So when you have this legacy, we'll say, of older women, and I think older women's stories need to be shared and told and amplified, but I think New York is such a changing, upbeat, high-octane, fast-paced city that the New York housewives that we had were just not telling a more fuller-fledged, holistic dynamic of what's what New York can offer. So I'm really excited yeah. to see the, the younger crew and what the new changes are in this era we're in. Is it okay if I go 10 more minutes, you guys? Is that okay with you, Taylor? Really? Is that is that okay? Okay, cool. Yeah. Is that okay if that's okay with you guys? Just let me know if it isn't. Um, yeah, okay, cool. Uh, so uh, back to uh, – well, that, actually, what you said about Roni, I just want to take a second to say, is that the reality of our lives, if we're showing a reality television show, we want to see the reality of what is going on. And sometimes that can be painful. Sometimes that can be – you know, uh, we've seen it again and again, and I think we are so sophisticated, and we are headed towards such a good place if we can open our ears and eyes to not just what we're so used to. And I think that's what you know, reality television, like you just said, it chips away. Queer Eye for the Straight Guy started off on Bravo. Like These messages get out there, and people might grumble 
crumble at first, but they open it up to so many new people that puts the ideas of lives that they don't know about and realize that we're all kind of one in a certain way. Um, back to Vanderpump Rules. Uh, just because I'm geeking out. What did you think of last night's episode where we start finding out that Tom is now, I mean, we don't, they're not saying it on the show, but Tom is now in the affair with Ra Raquel, Rachel, Ratchet, whatever we want to call her. <laughs> Ariana's gone because her grandmother passed away. Yeah, let's not forget Tom about is that part. And her dog passed away a couple weeks before. The dog just died. Her grandma just died. Why are, why are we still in town, Tom? Why aren't you home? With your you girlfriend. Know he, used the ex he used the excuse probably of like, I got a film. One of us got a film, you know? One of us got a film and, you know, like the shop, the shop. We just, we have a new tasting and I just got to meet with the friend. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, the sandwich, the sandwich was like about to open. But okay. <laughs> Katie's putting some PB&J on. He's like, there you go. Right. <laughs> um, I'm fascinated as a man watching these men hit the same playbook again and again and again. And I find it interesting of DJ James Kennedy, all of a sudden by default is becoming a hero, even though we've seen multiple seasons of him acting like insane. What is your opinion what? as a woman watching all of these men do the same dance and then kind of act like they're almost better than the man, even though they've done the same thing? You know, there's a phrase I say all the time. It's not all men, but enough men. And what's so interesting <laughs> is that when, like, when the bad man is pushed forward, the other men are like, oh, see, 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 bad, yeah. bad, that one's bad. Not me, though, not me. And it's like, <laughs> no, how long did you enable that behavior? And haven't you done that behavior yourself in some capacity? It might not be on a 10, like Sandoval, but maybe you were at like a, a five, a six, a seven. So this little, um, I can't even call it like a dick measuring game because they all lose or all shrinking. It's like, there's nothing interesting or special or unique about a man who stands forward and looks like the best because we have the dregs in front of us. And I don't think it's about the women having to make better choices or better decisions. We hear this all the time. Well, you just need to pick better guys. You need to date better guys. I would if they didn't seem like a good guy when I met them, right? Yeah, they're flat out lying. They're flat yeah, out right, lying. Right. Like, it's, it really drives me crazy because I expect men to do better, but enough men have not done well enough that all of us have to be skeptical. And I don't want to be that person. I don't want to look at every guy and be like, mm, I don't know what's going on here. Or, oh yeah, like you're just, you're an angel because you're not as bad as this. No, no. Shift the spectrum, cut it in half. I only want the good ones on this end. That's why I was so lucky in my last relationship. Like Joseph is just, an angel of a human being. And that's why we're still such good friends today. But I don't never let him on Van. Don't, do, never let him on Vanderpump rules. No. He will change. No. The show no. will change <laughs> this good man. Um, yes. uh, well, I mean, that that's the, the disc discourse around this too, which is so great because you wouldn't think 15 years ago, there would be discourse around reality television the way there is now, but there yeah. really is. I mean, sometimes though, it feels like a war between factions where it is interesting, even in the Sandoval stuff, I'll read things like, well, Ariana wasn't sleeping with him. Like the only purpose of a woman is to sleep with her man as much as he wants. And they oh. almost find reasons. There's so much like internalized misogyny here that I don't understand. Even as a dude, I don't understand it. Cause I'm like, how do you support all women? But then, like, I, she was being lied to. <laughs> make it make sense. <laughs> it make sense. It's so I funny mean, how that is supposed to work. But then you put it in the calculator and it's just like, error. It's oh, so funny. Ha, 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 ha. Hilarious. It's, it drives me crazy how people will find ways to blame women for the bad behavior and failures of men. And we see it over and over again. And you know what? Lala pointed that out. She said it point blank period at her birthday party to Miss Rachel Raquel, whatever we want to call her. She said, you will be the one to take the blame for this action that's happening where you are a mistress. And she absolved her for that, of that. She said, I don't yeah, think I'm... in this. Meanwhile, she actually is out here doing the dirty well, shit. <laughs> okay. As a, pa as a pageant, uh, as, as somebody that's been very su successful in pageants, the thing yeah. that scares me about Raquel Rachel Rocky is that I can't read her eyes at all. Like she is, 
know, right? There, there is a, there's a deadness. Like I, you know, like right now I can, I can read that like, okay, you're here, you're present, all of this stuff. Like last night they had a whole conversation about Raquel at the beach. I forgot Raquel was there in the scene. Uh-huh. They, she uh-huh. was right there sitting down saying nothing and they flashed to her and she didn't even look like she had a reaction. And that like, she was in with Ariana while she was cheating with Tom. I know it drives me crazy because again, I was a pageant woman who stepped into the reality TV stage. I'm not the first, I'm sure I won't be the last. Um, But what was unique about my experience in the big brother house is that I was targeted so heavily because I was a pageant girl and one of the many reasons, but I think so much of the conception of what a pageant girl is, is not connected in the brain, superficial, dishonest, or hard to read, or full of fluff and BS all the time. And I always took it upon myself to be a person that was as transparent as possible, as open as possible, because that's what you can and should do as a public figure, as someone. Nope. I think she just dipped out. Oh my God, did Tom Sandoval get to you? Did Tom Sandoval Sandoval in the feed? I was like, I I saw a man with a mustache behind you with a a cover band and I got scared. I'm alive, don't worry, I'm alive. (laughs) Um, But anyways, I was saying, you know, the stereotype of what a pageant girl is, I worked so hard to fight against and represent a different way. And then I look at Rachel, Raquel, Rocky, Ramona, whatever we want to call her, and I see... The stereotype, it's it's so hard because, I mean, I'm gonna go there now, like black women work so hard so often to break a stereotype or break out of um, something projected onto us and we will push that barrier. And then here comes a white woman that just like plucks and takes us right back to where we were. And so it's really hard to see that happening in real time because I worked so hard to push against that. And now you have Rachel and this pageant narrative. And it is so hard to see her as a human being on the show because we know what she's doing. We see her so disconnected and not present. And it's scary. It's really scary. I don't want to interact with somebody that I, I don't want to have to do this to somebody and say, wake up, be here. It doesn't make sense. And it's really infuriating because it's unfair to all the other women who are like me that try so hard not to be like that. I mean, that's you said so many amazing things right there. I, I I do think there is something too about like popping on screen. Like you pop on a screen. Raquel, like I think she must in real life to these men, I feel like she's a mirror to whatever their fantasies potentially are about themselves. So she mirrors that, but I can't like it's so funny that all of this fight is about her, yet when they cut to her, it is so like one note. There is no dynamic there as well as at, at all. But I mean I know this is a tough thing that you just talked, uh, opened up a little bit, but in terms of you are a woman dealing with that in this society, but you're also a black woman where every day of your life, you have had to go through things that I will never experience, that most people will never experience, yet you still keep this positive, upbeat smile on your face. You still are able to uh, clearly speak your thoughts. How do you do that? What advice do you give to other black women out there? Because sometimes I don't know how you do it. Yeah, you know, life is full of choices. And just by nature of who we are and where our society is, I am given a heavier bucket to carry. And I could choose to complain as I walk with that bucket, or I could choose to slowly pour it out as I'm walking and do it with a positive attitude. And that's not to say that I have to be positive all the time. Like anger is justified. Frustration is justified. But for me personally, if I live in that space, it's going to distract me from the work that I need to do to move forward and empty that bucket, that heavier bucket compared to everybody else. That is how I operate. I'm not going to shame or put anything against other black women who carry more anger or express more anger or frustration, because like I said, it is justified. But for me to do the work to move forward, I just have to be a happier person. I have to choose to be kind or let people show themselves and not put the energy into reacting and just focus on myself. Because again, I'm not going to drain my energy worrying about other people. I'm going to focus on me, my circle, and what it takes to keep moving and getting myself ahead and the rest of the people that I care about and people who are like me. 
Well, you've said you've said one of the best things. Yeah, God, I mean, I came into this a fan, and I'm leaving an even bigger fan, and that usually doesn't happen. I mean, I, like you've got my vote. Like, let's announce the <laughs> let's announce the candidacy right now. Taylor Hale, Hale Bailey, twenty four. I'm going to be the running oh, mate. It's prob- I'm going to okay. bring you down. I, I find, no, no, no. I need, I need to finally give men a voice. I need one of you on my ticket. So thank you. <laughs> 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 um listen i th- thank you so much for being as open as cool as funny um your your team said such amazing things about you and everybody that i've talked to are they're such huge fans of yours i hope you feel that i hope you feel all of the love and all the support out there for you because i think like i said earlier the world is your flipping oyster i'm scared you're going to start a podcast at this point you're going to be another person putting me out of business but you really like you are destined for such amazing things and i i hope you get it because wow what a you gave me so much energy Energy to take through the throughout the day and i can't wait for people to listen to this to you're gonna make them feel the same way how do we support you at this point like i know you've got the twitter feed the instagram where do we find out the can you tease anything that's coming up at all oh, you want a teaser you want a little, yes. little inside scoop okay, well first of all thank you for everything ryan and who knows maybe i will start a podcast i'd love to but i mean i can even start You'd my be great studio. You get it. We're here. We're still yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, but I will be launching a blog within the upcoming month. So you can find that website dropping very soon. And I'll be okay. pretty sharing all of my like favorite little tips, tricks, beauty secrets, and maybe even occasionally, uh, what are words? Occasionally giving some pop culture takes because I love to gossip. Um, and then in the meantime, I'm really working on breaking my foot into the entertainment news space. So, you know, I got to your contract with CBS. So, you know, we got to... We got to work together. We got to collaborate. <laughs> you've got a, so you've got a contract with CB. I'm trying to think like, oh, I mean, they should build so a show anybody, around you. Anybody on the show, anybody who's on Big Brother or any CBS, well, I won't say any CBS reality show, but any Big Brother contestant has to have a two year um, exclusivity oh, yeah. contract with CBS, the whole network. So, you know, we're all a little tied down. It's all ball and chain. CBS, if you're listening, build a show around here, build an entertainment news show, kind of like 48 hours murder mystery, but you pick a great entertainment topic each week, like a documentary on next, have her host it. It'll be in journalism mixed with pop culture and bringing all the things that we so dearly love because you would be perfect to steer that ship. Uh, Taylor Hale, my goodness, thank you so much for being here. And I hope, I hope you'll consider coming back sometime because this was just fantastic. Every time you want me, Ryan, I'm here. This is awesome. Okay, this holds up in court. Okay. <laughs>